Hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about rhetoric, and particularly the rhetorical triangle and rhetorical appeals. Rhetoric just means the art of persuasion. So the rhetorical triangle describes a way of conceptualizing a situation in which persuasion is the goal, and rhetorical appeals are the ways an author or speaker tries to persuade. In this video, we're going to break down some of these parts of rhetoric and then apply them to a couple of advertisements. Later in this unit, you'll use some of this knowledge to interpret particular texts, and then we'll work on applying some of the same techniques consciously in your writing. The rhetorical triangle was invented as a way to help people think about persuasion and the different participants in a situation where persuasion is the goal. Because the idea of rhetoric comes from ancient Greece, we often talk about the speaker, but obviously we aren't limiting ourselves just to oral communication. We'll often use the words author and speaker interchangeably, and they make up the first corner of the rhetorical triangle. Now, authors or speakers are usually responding to something in their larger context, and we call this the exigence, or the problem or issue that prompts them to communicate with someone else and to try and persuade them. An exigence might be that they need to sell a product, or it might be that they want to solve a problem. Obviously, the context and exigence are outside of the specific rhetorical triangle, as you can see here. So if the speaker is the first corner, then the second corner of the rhetorical triangle is the audience, or in a writing class, we might say the readers. It's important to realize that thinking of an audience as singular or monolithic can be misleading. Authors often have multiple audiences in mind, and they are trying to persuade many different groups. Sometimes they have a primary audience as their focus and a secondary audience in mind as well. Other times there are, um, there are intended audiences that can differ from incidental, accidental, or even unintentional or unwanted audiences, such as when a piece of private communication becomes public. This is important to consider because just because you're reading something doesn't mean that you were part of an intended audience. And that might affect how you interpret what the author is doing. Just because something the author is doing doesn't work for you or doesn't make sense doesn't mean that they have failed. It might just be that you're not part of the intended audience either uh, for the whole piece or for a specific element of the text. The third corner of the rhetorical triangle is the message. Uh, this is where we might put the specific position of the author or their thesis. However, just as we talked about when we discussed Harris and coming to terms, the position of the author might not be the same thing as the aim. The aim is what the author wants to accomplish through their persuasion and message. Sometimes all an author might want is acceptance of the message, but they might also want to inspire an audience to take action, even if they don't tell the audience that, or to change how the audience thinks about the exigence. In other words, the aim is the purpose or goal of the message in the specific space between the speaker, the audience, and the context. So the rhetorical triangle also gives us a structure that we can use to understand rhetorical appeals or the methods that speakers use to achieve their aims. There are four major types of appeals, each tied more to one part of the rhetorical triangle than the others, though they all overlap in reality and can work together. If you've taken AP language and composition, you may have heard of these different elements and know how to identify them, but we're going to try and go a little bit deeper than you may have done before. So the first rhetorical appeal is most closely tied to the speaker, and it is ethos. Ethos means, uh, most literally has its connections to the word ethics, but it's about the way a speaker demonstrates or develops their own credibility, authority, or trustworthiness. This can happen in a lot of different ways. An author can explain their own background and credentials, or they can demonstrate that they have done substantial research and borrow the authority that comes from that research. Authority can be built up through a sense of objectivity or even built on subjectivity through the author's personal connection to an issue. What type of ethos is actually successful or effective depends on the message, the speaker, and the audience, and perhaps the context. The second kind of rhetorical appeal is pathos, and the appeal is most directly tied to audience. You may have heard that pathos is about emotions, and it absolutely is, but it's more than just emotions. Pathos is about appealing either to the emotions or the values or the morals of the audience. We'll talk more about those different categories of pathos uh, in a second. The third type of rhetorical appeals are logos. Um, and logos is tied most closely to the message itself. 
Logos is about the logical reasoning that underpins the message. While it can overlap with or draw on pathos, we mostly think about it in terms of the kinds of evidence a speaker uses, the kinds of analysis that they do, and the logical connections they make between their points or to build to their conclusions. In other words, sometimes Logos is about structure. The fourth type of logical appeal is the most nebulous, and that is kairos. Kairos literally means timeliness, and it's about the appropriateness of the purpose or aim, the message or appeals to a particular moment in time or to a particular aspect of the context. So when we say a message or speech is timely, that's what we're invoking. When we look at all of these together, it's important to note that they're always grounded in the materials of an author, the author's evidence, their examples, their word choices, but they're ultimately about the methods of using those materials. Now, of the four kinds of appeals, logos and pathos are the ones students struggle with the most, not in terms of knowing that pathos or logos are being used in a general sense, but in terms of being able to get specific enough with the methods. We know that evidence is being presented in a way that seems logical, but we might have a harder time explaining what that logic is. We know that a story pulls on our heartstrings, and so is pathos, but we have a harder time figuring out which emotions it's targeting or how it's doing so. We won't be able to cover all the different types of logos and pathos, but I want to point out a couple things that you can look for to help you. When it comes to logos, one of the things you might want to look at is whether an author is using deductive or inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning starts with a general principle and then applies it to a specific situation in order to understand that situation. Inductive reasoning works in the opposite way, by starting with the specifics of a situation and then deriving the general principles from that situation. But beyond deductive and inductive reasoning, which can be harder to pinpoint in complex written arguments than in syllogisms, there are things you can look for that highlight specific types of logical moves, and they mostly have to do with the structure of an argument. One of the things to look at is the order in which ideas are presented. Sometimes you'll see that an author describes causes and then thinks about the effects, or starts with the effects and then tries to figure out what the causes are. You can see this especially depending on how an author uses chronology as part of an argument. Another significant and common logos strategy is inherently based in comparison. When authors talk about correlations, they're comparing two things and seeing if they can identify a relationship between them. Correlations can lead to identifying causes and effects, but not always. Sometimes comparisons are um, work in a little bit different way, such as when people compare and contrast two things as part of their evidence. And then there's also really subtle forms of comparison when authors use an analogy or metaphor to draw a conclusion. There are a lot of other types of logos, but these are just a few examples. The goal is to look at how an author fits together different pieces of evidence in order to come to a conclusion or to support their point. All right, so the flip side of this is pathos. It's um, about how audiences react to evidence or logic. The first and most obvious form of pathos is when an author tries to elicit an emotion. Are they trying to make you feel anger or fear, sadness, love, sympathy, disgust, shock, futility? But pathos might not just be about creating those emotions or eliciting them, sometimes they're about managing those emotions. How does an author try and minimize or maximize the emotions felt by the reader? Another less obvious way an author can use pathos is to think about and draw on something the audience values. Sometimes values are nearly universal, even if we might value them more or less based on the context or issue. So fairness, honesty, innocence, freedom, safety, humanity, equality, friendship, beauty. Others are very particular and tied to specific institutions, cultures, or identities. Um, so thinking about the value of family, that might be different based on what culture you're in um, or might have different resonances for different people. Patriotism felt by a lot of people, but what that looks like might take a very different form. Uh, religion, masculinity or femininity, community, individuality, all of these are different ways that our identities and our cultures can be invoked in order to try and persuade us.
So now let's try and practice applying our understanding of rhetorical appeals to a very explicit attempt at persuasion, an advertisement. One of the nice things about doing a rhetorical analysis of an advertisement is that we usually know the exigence to sell something. It's not always that simple, but it's a good starting point. So here we have an advertisement from the 1950s selling camel cigarettes. At the top is an image of a man in a white coat holding a cigarette with this text beside him. He's one of the busiest men in town. While his do door may say office hours two to four, he's actually on call 24 hours a day. The doctor is a scientist, a diplomat, and a friendly, sympathetic human being all in one, no matter how long and hard his schedule. Below that is a headline. According to a recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Underneath that is a small text box reading, doctors in every branch of medicine, 113, 597 in all, were queried in this nationwide study of cigarette preference. Three leading research organizations made the survey. The gist of the query was, quote, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. The rich, full flavor and cool mildness of Camel's superb blend of costlier tobaccos seems to have the same appeal to the smoking taste of doctors as to millions of other smokers. If you're a Camel smoker, this preference among doctors will hardly surprise you. If you're not, well, try Camel's now. Off to the right is a picture of a young woman with a T transposed over her face with the text, your T zone will tell you T is for taste, T is for throat. That's your proving ground for any cigarette. See if camels don't suit your T zone to a T. Okay, so what do we see here in terms of each of the different rhetorical appeals? It's important to remember that all the different appeals might overlap, but let's try and break them down. So first, ethos or authority and credibility. First, the credibility or authority comes from doctors in two ways. The doctor at the top is described in a way that makes him seem authoritative and trustworthy, not just because of his medical knowledge, though that's implied, but because of his busyness, and also because he's a sympathetic and friendly human being. Doctors are portrayed as being particularly caring. That's important because the survey they used is a survey of doctors, not just regular people. Of course, the survey is another way that the ad tries to build its credibility. It says that in it, it is a nationwide survey, it names the number of participants, which is very large and specific, and it tells us that three different companies all helped with the study. This makes the research seem more credible. We'll get to whether it's actually credible in a little bit. You'll notice that a lot of what we're describing, though, isn't just about ethos and credibility. It's about pathos and values, in part because what makes someone or something trustworthy is how they accord with our values. So here, the ethos is grounded partly in pathos, particularly in how we value science, medicine, care and dedication to others, and even things like business and productivity. We can see these same values being invoked in the T-zone section of the advertisement. Here, there's a sense of individuality and rationality being invoked. It's almost like the audience is being invited to be a scientist, to run a test themselves. So, that's ethos. What about logos? Well, we've already mentioned the survey, but it's worth thinking about how it specifically draws the audience to the conclusion it wants. The first point it makes is that when doctors are asked what form of cigarettes they smoke, the brand named most was Camel. Then it describes Camels. There's an implied logic here. If doctors like Camels, there must be a good reason. And here are some features that might be why, the flavor and mildness. But there's another logic here through the comparison of the doctors to millions of other smokers. Logos overlaps with pathos, though, because the goal seems to make the smokers who already use camels to be superior. They're like the authoritative doctor in the image at the top of the advertisement. They're on a little secret, in on a little secret. And that's when the final piece of the logic puzzle drops in, an implied if-then statement. If you don't already smoke camels, then you are missing out on what everyone else already knows. Oh, wait, that means there's also a pathos move there, relying on FOMO or the fear of missing out. Yes, even in the 1950s. Okay, so we've got ethos, logos, and pathos intertwined with both. So finally, Kairos. Let's face it, this is an ad that only works in the time period in which it was created. It would never fly today because our knowledge about smoking has changed so substantially. 
we would never believe that doctors would sm support smoking camel cigarettes. And it's at this point I want to address the elephant, or should I say camel, in the room. This advertisement engages in some really shady uses of ethos, pathos, and logos. For example, the authority that comes from that survey, it's worth noting that they radically misrepresent the survey. What actually happened is that Camel hired these three research companies to go to different medical conventions. At the start of the day, they handed out packs of Camel cigarettes to all the doctors. Then later, they went around and asked doctors not what brand of cigarettes do you prefer, but what cigarettes are you smoking? Because they had all been given free Camel cigarettes, of course most answered Camel. Nothing about this advertisement's evidence is technically false, in other words, but it is highly misleading. In other words, it's important to remember that rhetoric is a set of tools, and it's up to the speaker to use those tools responsibly. And that's not happening here. Now, there are a lot more different elements we could look at that also play into the rhetoric of this advertisement. Uh, we haven't even touched on visual design elements like color or font and, or the posture of the spokesperson. We haven't thought about the gender roles that are portrayed here. Um, we haven't looked at all the different values and emotions that are invoked. This is actually so far a pretty superficial analysis, but I hope you can see how it can really start to think through a speaker's methods more concretely when you use rhetorical analysis.